Uh, my name is Larry Hoffheimer, and I am the founder and chairman of the Bachelor Degeneration Association. I want to welcome you all to our program today, uh, which is an SDS expert. Our speakers today are both our medical directors, and you're going to find their, their uh, knowledge is extremely helpful. I also want to thank Regeneron and Novartis uh, for their support in supporting these events, as well as Dotovision, which you'll hear from later today, uh, later in this program. So it's, uh, I'd like to begin to open this up to questions and uh, of both Dr. Malley and Dr. Gerson. Larry, thank you. Uh... For the introduction. Uh, my name is Jeff Gerson. As Larry mentioned, I'm the Optometric Medical Director uh, for the Macular Degeneration Association. My colleague, Dr. Malley, is actually just finishing up with, I believe, a macular degeneration patient and will be with us in just a moment. Uh, so just so everybody knows, we don't really have uh, prepared comments today. <clears throat> and the idea or what we were hoping was to be able to answer your questions. So in order to ask your questions, just go to the Q&A section and type in your questions and we will answer those live here for you. So for example, somebody just typed in the question, why does it seem that there's more research for wet macular degeneration and nothing for dry macular degeneration? So that's a, that's a really good question because uh, what we seem to hear about the most is in fact the research for wet macular degeneration and more importantly, there have been successes in treatment for wet macular degeneration. For example, the, the different approved injectable medications that are available today. Now, that being said, there has been a fair amount of research into uh, dry macular degeneration. The most notable is uh, what's called the ARIDS and ARIDS-2 studies, studies looking at using specific vitamin supplements for people with dry macular degeneration. And in fact, <clears throat> for certain stages of dry macular degeneration, we know that taking the right supplement is tremendously beneficial. So let me touch on a couple other things that, are, that have been looked at in dry macular degeneration recently. So one of them is that, um, uh, so, so first of all, there've been a couple that have not worked out. So, you know, luckily, you know, in the news recently, even today was about Johnson and Johnson's COVID vaccine that made it through their phase three trial and it was being applied for emergency youth authorization this week. And so there are many macular degeneration for dry AMD drugs that get to that same phase three, but don't end up panning out. So ultimately they fail in trials. Um, there is, however, an injectable medication that has done very well in phase two that for people with what's called intermediate dry AMD, so more than just real mild, but not yet wet, that it seems to be promising for them. Again, that is an injectable. And there is a <clears throat> phase three clinical trial going on in the United States for something that is for a device that uses a specific wavelength of red light. And yeah, you heard that right. It's not an injection, it's not drops, it's just red light. So using a specific red light to try to treat and potentially reverse dry macular degeneration. As a matter of fact, this is a treatment that's already been approved and being used in Europe. So uh, to me, that's kind of exciting. Again, that's in phase three here in the United States. So um, things in phase three don't go as quickly as COVID vaccines went, unfortunately. So it'll be a few years. Uh, before we see this come into clinical, clinical use. Um, so great, so we've got some questions that are coming in. So I'm gonna start just going down the list and start answering some of the questions. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, is there any treatment for myopic macular degeneration? And the answer for that is that really uh, the treatment for myopic macular degeneration is essentially the same as age-related macular degeneration. They are different disease processes with different causes, but the treatment right now is the same for both, and that is the anti-VEGF injectable medications. So, um, so yeah, so it's you know similar thing by a different name. Um, 
let's see. Uh, I notice sometimes my vision is not as clear as other times. You know, I have to tell you, that's something that I hear uh, in clinical practice all the time. I hear that a lot. And macular degeneration doesn't kind of ebb and flow throughout the day or from day to day. It doesn't get better, worse, better, worse. Generally, if anything happens with macular degeneration, it just unfortunately gets worse. So if vision is fluctuating throughout the day, the most likely cause is that your eyes are dry. So that the surface of your eyes, so not dry macular degeneration, but dry eyes. And the easiest way to address this is usually with some artificial teardrops. If using artificial teardrops once or twice a day is not enough and you your eyes still either feel dry or you have fluctuations from it, then that's something to see your eye care provider about because there are prescription medications and other things we can do if you do suffer from dry eyes. Um, so that I would tell you is probably the most common reason for vision fluctuating. And some of the things that cause our eyes to dry out throughout the day and our vision to fluctuate is if we're staring at a screen like we are now. When you stare at a screen or you stare at anything for that matter and you don't blink, your eyes tend to dry out. And so if you know you're gonna sit in front of a screen to watch something like this, or to watch something, maybe you put a drop of artificial tears in before you start so that your eyes don't in fact dry out. And so, and there's another question, is dry eye, are dry eye and dry macular degeneration the same? And so they're actually very, very different uh, conditions. So dry macular degeneration affects the macula, which is in the back of the inside of your eye and dry eyes affects the surface of your eyes. So basically the outside front surface of your eyes. And where macular, dry macular degeneration, we talked about generally all we can do right now is supplements and lifestyle changes, which are very, very important. Um, for dry eyes, there's all kinds of different um, eye drops, many different types of artificial tears. They're all different, they're not all the same. Uh, there are a number of prescription medications and a number of procedures that can be done to help out with dry eyes. So they're, they're very, very different. A uh, very timely question, is it safe to go to the eye doctor during COVID? Um, and I guess um, what I would tell you is I hope so because uh, I'm at the eye doctor's office virtually every day providing care. And so what I would tell you is, is that eye doctor's offices should be a very, very safe place to be able to go. I can tell you that in my practice amongst the two offices, <clears throat> we have nearly 40 employees and only one employee has had COVID and um, she got it from someone outside the office um, and everyone around her in the office was tested. No one else was positive. So in our office, everyone's wearing masks. Uh, we have hand sanitizer everywhere. We try to keep distance between patients. We've lowered our patient load. We've taken all sorts of, of precautionary measures and I think that's kind of the same throughout the eye care community. So I would contend that uh, going to the eye doctor's office is a, actually a very safe place to be able to go. Um, and so I see that Dr. Malley has joined us. So Dr. Malley, you just missed the first couple questions, not too much, but this is Dr. Josh Malley, our uh, medical director for ophthalmologists. And Thanks, everybody. we just started kind of going through the questions. So, uh, so this is... Uh, Perfect timing. So I guess I guess since you joined in, I get to ask you some questions, Josh. Uh, someone uh, sent in that I'm hearing more about gene therapy. How will this help me with dry macular degeneration? Yeah, gene therapy is a very promising treatment, um, and I, I think there's you know a lot of promise behind it. Uh, I would kind of caution that it's still very early stages uh, in in being reviewed uh, in kind of early uh, phase, phases of clinical trial development, but I think it's still a very promising treatment. Now, um, it's been used kind of in two, two ways. One is for wet macular degeneration, um, which the idea behind, behind gene therapy for wet macular degeneration is, let's take a step back. Let's, let's talk about what is gene therapy, because sometimes it gets very you know, confused, the idea of it. But basically what we're doing is we're, um, implanting a kind of a kind of an inactive virus uh, that helps to encode cells uh, inside whatever organ we're, we're focused on. So in this case, we're focused on the eye. So we have this virus that has a, a particular purpose that it helps to help that cell make some sort of defective 
protein that we need, that this, that this organ needs. So um, that's kind of the idea, of, uh, generally speaking, for gene therapy. Now, in how to use it in wet macular generation, um, basically we're, we're making, we're using the medication or our gene therapy to help increase production of basically what we inject into the eye right now for, for wet macular duration. So all these anti, these anti-VEGF treatments that we, that we do, these injections, it's just having your cells kind of create um, mm -hmm. uh, that medication inside the eye. So that's the kind of the idea behind the wet form uh, treatment. Now, in, to actually answer the question uh, for the dry form, um, basically the idea um, is, you know, it, it's a little bit more of a challenge um, because it's not really used, uh, uh, you know, for that purpose. So there, there's still some studies being looked at for, for the dry type, but really it's being focused on for the wet form. All right. Um, so you know, along the same line of, of questions, um, Josh, that, that I, we, I think we've gotten before, so let's address it, is stem cells. So what are your thoughts on current or future use of stem cells in macular degeneration? Yeah, and, and again, I think this is uh, sort of, gets very commonly confused with, with gene therapy. And again, it's two different things. So as I mentioned, what gene therapy was, uh, stem cells are actually taking cells that we're able to insert um, inside the body in, in any particular organ, and we kind of design them to uh, basically replace the tissue or replace the cells that are damaged inside that organ. So in this case, we're focusing on the eye. So we're taking cells that haven't really differentiated into, into any particular organ, but direct them towards uh, becoming cells of the retina in particular, the ones that are really damaged by, um, you know, retinal like macular degeneration and, and things that affect the retina. So we're directing these stem cells, you know, towards that particular purpose. Um, and this one, now stem cells can actually treat theoretically, potentially either one, right? Because either wet or dry macular degeneration. So for wet macular degeneration, you know, in really advanced cases, you have scarring of, of the layers of the retina. And the theory is that if we can use stem cells to basically repopulate um, that area of the retina that's been damaged by the scar tissue from now that's inactive wet macular degeneration, we can maybe restore some of the function to the to the whole retina. So that's the idea behind the wet form type. Now for the treatment of the dry uh, macular degeneration, this is actually a little bit more exciting because really in the dry type and really advanced forms of the dry type, um, you get something called geographic atrophy, which is really a breakdown of the very center of the retina from really advanced dry AMD. And the idea is taking these stem cells and basically replenishing that area that has just been degraded and damaged over time in patients with, with uh, really advanced dry AMD. So, I, I mean, I have patients that, you know, have pretty significant visual loss from dry AMD. You know, people say, which one, which type is better to have, dry or wet? And, and that's really, if you have advanced dry, it can be just as devastating as having, you know, a, a, you know wet AMD. So, um, I, I think really it's, it's, probably the most, has probably the most potential because you're essentially replacing the damaged tissue in the retina. And, and that's really the, the key thing that the key problem in really advanced dry AMD. So it's a very promising, again, very promising treatment. Again, very early in tr clinical trials. Um, it just completed basically phase one, which has shown that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of safe. It's relatively safe, um, but does it really work? And that's what we're, with future trials, going to, answer that question hopefully that you know does this treatment actually work for for this condition so right now we, we determine it's, it's relatively safe but now just see if it actually works yeah and i think we should also be clear that as of now there is no fda approved stem cell therapy for macular degeneration um so there was someone asking that asking, could the COVID-19 vaccine cause problems with my wet AMD injections? I'm nervous about getting the vaccine. I haven't heard of any eye-related complications. Have you, Josh? So I, I have um, heard of just the virus itself causing, you know, obviously eye, eye issues. And actually there, more recently we've been in the literature, there's note of um, some retinal changes that can occur. Um, in the retinal layers and can be picked up on, on testing like OCT testing. Um, 
So we do know, what, I'll tell you what we do know is we do know that, that COVID-19 does affect the eye and does affect the retina. Um, and I agree with you, Dr. Gerson. I, I, I don't think there's any evidence to say that the vaccine actually affects the eye or maturation in any way uh, thus far. Again, we'll, we'll know more once the vaccine has been in circulation and has been you know, studied for longer. But I mean, to be quite frank, I think you have a high, you always have to weigh out benefits and risks of things. And I think there's a higher risk of damaging your eye from getting the virus than potential theoretical possibilities of long-term side effects from the, the vaccine to the eye. So I, I think I would certainly recommend still getting the vaccine. And, and I don't think there should be any concern about any effect on um, your treatment for maturation and or uh, for making your condition worse. So here's an interesting one. It, it's someone that's saying that they were diagnosed with macular degeneration um, basically a long time ago when they were uh, in their 40s, have been on ARIDS vitamins for a number of years, but that the amount of drusen or changes in the eye continues to increase. And so she says, what are the chances that I, that I will lose, that I, her mother, by the way, uh, went completely blind or had vision loss from macular degeneration. So the question is, what are the chances I will also lose my sight and how long do I have? Since I have dry AMD, there's nothing that can be done for me according to my retina specialist. So, you know, I think the, the one misconception about macular degeneration is it can cause complete blindness. And so real quickly, I just wanna just, just kind of, I guess, differentiate two terms. So there's a big difference between being uh, legally blind which just has to do with how big of a letter you can see on the chart. So basically it means you can't see the big E or someone that is blind. And blindness is like if you close your eyes and put your hands over your eyes and you can't see anything. And unfortunately what macular degeneration can do is it can, it can take your central vision and cause you not to be able to see letters on an eye chart or facial features or to be able to read. But what macular degeneration on its own does not do is take away your side vision which is really important for getting around and functioning. So just because someone has macular degeneration, number one, doesn't mean that they will lose vision or go blind. Um, doesn't mean that they'll lose any peripheral vision from the macular degeneration. So the reason I point that out is I, I, would, I would hate for anyone to ever be living with the assumption that, that they will lose vision from macular degeneration. So, uh, it sounds like your retina specialist has you taking the, an ARIDS 2 supplement. And so we know that that helps decrease the likelihood of progression. But other things like not smoking and just in general, healthy lifestyle habits. So things that any doctor would tell you to do are also good as far as macular degeneration is concerned. So I guess the, the sh my short answer is I wouldn't assume you'll lose vision, um, but that taking all the right steps, lifestyle associated things like that can be helpful for you. And Dr. Malley, I don't know if you have uh, anything else to add to that. Yeah, I think those are all great points. And um, you know, certainly it really depends on what stage you're classified when you're first diagnosed or, or where you are now. I mean, certainly someone that's kind of in the early AMD phase is much different than someone that's more of a you know advanced case or more of a severe case upon presentation. So I think, and you know, again, I think it's important to follow up with your eye doctor uh, over time, and you know, they'll really be able to give you a sense of you know how fast this is progress pro uh, progressing because I think that's the most important point. I think really a good determining good determining factor of you know how you know how how much risk am I? And that, that's a common question I always get is is really how much risk am I at, at developing you know you know visual loss from AMD? That's a very common question, like what we're talking about. And I think it, the really the key factor is you know what you look like today. And over time, when we follow you, how fast are you progressing? And that can give you a really good idea of, you know, your chances of, of and your risks of visual loss over time. And, and certainly someone that's progressing faster and has a faster uh, rate of change is at a higher risk of not only developing wet macular duration, but also developing worsening of their, of their dry type of macular duration. So I think the rate of progression is a really important point. And if you haven't ask your eye doctor about that, I think it's a, certainly a good question to ask them because you can really look back at it either, you know, they sometimes, you know, we take um, pictures of, of the retina uh, periodically. And obviously, usually we get a scan each time patients come in. So uh, no CT scan. So 
I would say either using both of those or a combination of those, you, one and over a couple of years can really give a patient a, a pretty good idea of how much they're at risk for visual loss. So I mean, certainly um, you have to kind of look at that that risk of progression and rate of progression as your key determining factor of you know is this patient going to lose vision over time? What are the chances? And again, things can change. I mean, people can develop you know what macular duration you know, really at the moderate, any time at the moderate stage. Um, but it's really unusual for an early AMD patient with an extremely slow rate of progression to have any sort of significant visual loss um, in their lifetime. So um, I think that's just an important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, you know, a couple of things that I'll add to that real quickly is that, um, you know, one of the things we know, well, so a couple of things. One, the treatments for macular degeneration today are dramatically different than they were when this person's, you know, when they mentioned a parent, treatments today are dramatically different and better than they were 20 years ago. And so because of that, outcomes today are dramatically better than they were 20 years ago. Um, the other thing that I'll point out is one of the, the best predictors of how well someone will do, even if they need injections, to Dr. Malley's point, is what's your vision when you start needing injections? If you still have good vision, then with injections, you're pretty likely to maintain good vision. And so that, that brings up a point that I, that I want to bring up that I think is really important for people with AMD. And that is, you know, Dr. Malley mentioned the importance of discussing things with your eye doctor, but that we can't ignore our vision in between our visits. And so if you have macular degeneration, it's really important to be monitoring your vision over time in between your visits. And so one of the ways that many people monitor their vision is they're given a grid to monitor their vision. It's called an Amsler grid. So a bunch of lines, and there's a very specific way that we need to use that to try to see if there's changes. But one of the things I want to bring up, because I think it, it really relates to people's outcomes, is another a totally different way of monitoring your vision at home that we'll hear a little bit about at the very end of the presentation. But it's a device called the 4C Home. And it is a digital device that um, you monitor your vision with. And it's remotely monitored using artificial intelligence. And if there's a change over time, your doctor is alerted. And so it is a very, very sensitive way to pick up changes very early before you might even notice it. So I think it's a technology that if you haven't heard of that, it's, it may be worth asking your doctor if it's something that you qualify for. And the other thing that's really cool about it, so it's two things. One, it works great in finding changes to wet macular degeneration compared to any other um, traditional way that we try to find it while monitoring from home. So that's fantastic. And number two, for majority of people that are on Medicare, it ends up not costing anything. So if someone has Medicare and a secondary insurance, it's pretty likely that it won't cost even a penny to do this. If you only have Medicare, then it costs usually less than $15 a month. So it works great. It's affordable, and it's something that I would really encourage you to ask your uh, eye doctor if it's something that, um, that you may qualify for or that you may be a good candidate for using it. Uh, Dr. Malley, there's a question. I have glaucoma, and now I've been told I also have macular degeneration. Did the glaucoma cause the macular degeneration, or did the macular degeneration cause the glaucoma? So, I mean... Certainly, these are two different diseases completely. Um, you know, the, with glaucoma, that really affects the optic nerve of the eye, uh, which over time can cause uh, sort of peripheral, you know, peripheral vision defects and so forth, um, which is completely separate from AMD, which, um, you know, really is involved in the macula, the very center part of the retina, and is a completely different process altogether. So. We really haven't had a, seen a correlation between um, glaucoma and AMD. I mean, patients that have, you know, AMD can develop glaucoma and, and vice versa, uh, but they're, you know, they're not really kind of causative of each other. Um, and, and when I'm saying, I mean, that's really for dry AMD. Now, um, it's it's kind of uh, inconclusive whether or not, um, you know, over time do repeated eye injections with with the volume of medication we use in the eye, does that cause the pressure of the eye to increase over time? That's a very controversial thing at this point. We're, we're really not sure one way or another. Um, there's evidence to support things on both sides, um, but theoretically, you know, elevated intraocular pressure 
or eye pressure can um, theoretically maybe lead to glaucoma, um, but that's not necessarily you know uh, kind of uh, been confirmed yet. But we're we're looking at that. We're looking to see if that's an association there. But I can clearly state that um, there is no association between you know glaucoma and dry AMD. That that I can tell you for sure. Yeah. So we have a question. Is there any other way to deliver the medication for wet AMD other than injections? I'm tired of getting them. Uh, it's a great question. Um, unfortunately, at this time, the best treatment for wet macular degeneration does consist of injections into the eye. And, you know, I, I don't do injections as an optometrist, so this is really easy for me to say and say to my patients. But I think Dr. Malley would agree that what if you ask people to get injections. If you ask them if it's a pleasant experience, the answer will probably be no, they prefer not to have to get them. But if you ask people whether it's a painful thing, generally it's not painful. And what I tell my patients is the worst part of getting injections is your anxiety when you first learn that that's the treatment. But then that the actual treatment itself really isn't, isn't all that bad. It's not that big of a deal. So Unfortunately, no, there's, there's not anything other than injections right now. Um, there have been some studies looking at drops, um, but those haven't panned out. So that's why for now, all we have, or at least, I shouldn't say all we have, what I should say is at least we have the injectable medications. Um, okay, so here's another one. I understand that drusen are composed of lipids. Is there any special diet that can hold drusen at bay? Dr. Malley, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, certainly I always encourage all my patients to have a nice healthy diet, nice balanced healthy diet, um, you know, green leafy vegetables and so forth. And what we're finding actually, um, you know, is, again, I, I don't consider it a major risk factor, um, but certainly elevated cholesterol levels, there may be something to that actually. Um, and I, I think over time we may find there may be some association with elevated cholesterol levels and development of, you know, um, AMD and, and, and Drews and so forth. You know, we're, we're finding that there may be like some benefits to, you know, when patients are already on medications um, like Lipitor, things like that are helping to um, decrease their cholesterol. We're finding that may benefit AMD as well. There still isn't really a strong association there, so it's hard to, to definitely make that. But I think, you know, just to me, scientifically, it makes sense that uh, if, if you have you know, better cholesterol levels, you know, you're theoretically, your, your circulation will be improved and you may um, lower your risk of developing these kind of issues, especially like with AMD. So I think we haven't made that link yet, but we're starting to kind of get some early, some data out that's maybe suggesting that. Um, so stay tuned for that. But I, I think there's common sense. I think, I think it does make sense to just have a nice, healthy diet and limiting your, your, um, your cholesterol intake. Yeah, and you know, the other thing, that there's been some fairly recent publications about is Mediterranean diet. So following a Mediterranean diet could potentially uh, help prevent changes in macular degeneration, both to from dry to wet, and also to, to a more advanced stage of dry macular degeneration. So I think that's something that's worth looking into is a uh, Medi Mediterranean style diet. Um, so we have a question. I have moderate dry AMD, also a retinal pucker, I understand there is a procedure to remove the pucker. Is this recommended and will it affect the AMD? So how would you talk, how would you counsel a patient through that, Dr. Malley? It's actually a really good question. I, I mean, it's it's a situation that I see very, you know, actually pretty commonly, and this is again what I do. Um, but certainly I think it, you know, you have to keep in mind a few things. Whenever a patient like like that presents to me, I look at a couple of things. First of all, I look at what their vision is on the eye chart. So visual acuity when they present to me is a very important factor. Um, now, one thing I'll say is that even though a vision may be like someone is 2025 20, or 2020 20 on the vision on the eye chart, sometimes that doesn't mean that that's a good quality vision. So I also do that into consideration. So even though they're 2020 20 on the eye chart, you know, what's their actual function or quality of vision that they're actually seeing? And that can be variable. And, and that's kind of uh, an important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, the second thing is that, you know, really both, and depends on what stage of AMD, if it's moderate, like I think that's what, what, what this particular patient said, but um, yeah, what stage their AMD is at, 
and how much that's affecting their retina. And then how extensive is their macular pucker, which is basically just like scar tissue on the very surface of the retina. So unfortunately, you're kind of affecting the retina at different points. With, with the pucker, you're affecting the top portion of the retina. And with the macular generation, you're affecting the kind of bottom portion of the retina. So kind of a bad things on, on, on both sides. But um, really, that it, it depends on how much the patients are bothered by their vision. That, that's an important thing for me to determine if intervention is warranted. So certainly, if someone is having difficulties reading, driving, um, you know, daily activities, and it's attributed attributable to the the retina. Like, there's no other reason. Like, they're not their eyes are not dry. You know, dry eyes. They're uh, you know don't have a extensive cataract, or maybe they've already had cataract surgery. So if I, if I don't see another reason for why their vision is down, I can fairly assume that it's probably the retina. And again, unfortunately, both these conditions, both AMD and um, macular pucker, affect the vision kind of in the same way, in the sense of you get sort of a wavy distortion of the vision. And that's what people usually report with both conditions. So it can be a, somewhat of a challenge to say which, which one is actually affecting the retina more and which one, you know, would addressing the pucker, would that give the patient uh, a significant benefit um, to improving their vision and improving that distortion uh, with any sort of surgery, surgical intervention? And I think that that's a really, it depends on the situation, depends on how the retina looks, especially on the, on the OCT scan, you know, how, what's that retinal anatomy looking like and which one do I think that, um, you know, is, is affecting the retina more. It's really up to the, the doctor to look at that. Um, but certainly I think if, if a patient, a patient like this is at the point where they feel like their vision is, you know, really, you know, distorted and they are unable to get any useful vision out of the eye, you know, I think considering uh, a surgical intervention for the macular pucker is very, is very reasonable with the expectation that, you know, likely even with this surgery, you may still have some, you'll still have some distortion because of the macular generation. So I think it's an important thing to remember. So I think certainly you have to weigh out the risks and benefits, um, but again, it's a very safe surgery, but I think you have to really weigh out, you know, would, would someone get benefit from having a macular pucker surgery? Because it's not, that's not addressing the AMD part. So um, I think it's just really uh, weighing out the benefits and the risks. You know, there's another question that, I, that I'll answer pretty quickly, and that is, uh, is getting eyelid surgery okay if you have dry macular degeneration? I'd say the answer to that is yes, because two completely different areas. So eyelid surgery isn't even actually eye surgery or eyeball surgery, if you want to think of it that way. So it should have no effect on uh, macular degeneration. So that should be uh, completely safe. Um, so, it, you know, there's a, a really interesting question here. And it says, uh, my vision is bad and I see things that aren't there. Why is that happening? I'm afraid to say anything. And so I really appreciate that question being sent in um, because you know we know that people with macular degeneration are a lot more likely to suffer from anxiety or depression than people of the same age that don't have macular degeneration. And the condition that was brought up here about seeing things that aren't there, there's actually a name for that. Uh, and it's actually one of the topics that we had proposed for uh, Larry mentioned that we'll be having at least 30 more talks over the course of the rest of this year. And one of them it, we may devote to this very topic is called Charles Bonnet syndrome. So it is a well-known thing that when people lose vision, they may still see things even when they're not there. So the example that I'll give you that I think can help to explain it is sometimes people, even after they have a leg amputated or an arm amputated, they feel, still feel a phantom pain in that limb that's no longer there. And so it's a similar idea here that we're still seeing things even though we, they're not there and we're not really seeing them. So the message that I would wanna get through to the person that's asking this, there are a couple messages are, one, what you're experiencing is very common. Two, and I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's normal, but because it's so common, it's, it's almost normal. And three, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. You're not losing your mind. This is unfortunately just something that happens. So I really appreciate that question. I think it's, and I think it's an important one to uh, get out in, into the open. Um, so we have a question. Is there any benefit to using Bayview versus ILEA? I'll give the quick answer and we'll see if Dr. Malley has a different take. And so the take that I would give 
is that we don't necessarily know which medication will be best for each patient. And so generally a retina specialist will start with one and see how a patient's doing for the first several injections. And if not getting a response, may switch to a different medication. And so there's not just an easy answer of if, you know, that everyone should start with this one or everyone should start with that one. I think it's more up to the retina specialist to decide how are you responding to the particular treatment that you're getting. Yeah, I mean, cer certainly, you know, it, it's always uh, kind of a, a key question that patients ask, you know, which medication, you know, to start. And, and again, I, I think really, um, you know, it's a discussion between, you know, the doctor and, and the patient. And I think really, I present, you know, options for my patients. So sometimes it's unfortunately dictated by insurance companies on, on occasion. You know, again, we're sometimes required to start out with a certain medication first and then and then if patients don't respond well then we have to try a different one um, but at the end of the day most patients were able to sort of start whatever we want to and what what we feel like is best for the patient again it's it's very variable i think the key the key answer is it's whatever you will do the best with and what you're doing well with and i think what we're able to do is try to get you on the longest interval, interval possible while keeping your disease inactive and i think that that's just the goal of every retina specialist and i mean certainly it just everybody's different and um, it's, it's hard to, to make it a, a, you know, kind of a, you know, widespread thing. It's just really individualized for sure. So there's a couple of different questions about different kinds of lenses. So I want to address those um, real quick here. So one of, one of them is, can you explain about the, the glasses that help block out blue light? Are these beneficial for someone with macular degeneration? Um, you know, I, what I would tell you, and again, we'll see what Dr. Malley says, is that um, evidence that blue blocking lenses are beneficial for macular degeneration is pretty minimal. And that, you know, is blocking the blue light, can it be harmful for macular degeneration? No. But is it going to be beneficial? I would almost go so far as to say that's a little bit of a stretch and that that should not be the primary mode of prevention or treatment it's maybe a part of what you're doing, um, but it's not certainly not a, the main part uh, for anybody, whether it's macular, you know, whether you have dry macular degeneration or not. Interestingly, blue, uh, lenses that block blue light, especially if you're on a computer a lot, may help with your sleep pattern because too much blue light, especially from screens, can throw off how well you sleep. Uh, there's a question about sunglasses. What color sunglasses should I wear outside? I have some, I've lost some of my vision. Well, kind of like what Dr. Malley said, that the right injection is the one that works for you. I would tell you that the right sunglasses are the ones that work for you. There's not necessarily one that will uh, help everyone see better or make everyone more comfortable or be more beneficial for your disease. What's important is what helps you to feel or see better uh, when you're outside. And then the last one that I'll answer here, kind of rapid fire, is can I drive with a magnifier on one of my lenses? And it's a great question because when asking that, that implies that you have some sort of a telescopic device on one of your lenses, which means you've seen a low vision specialist, which I think is a really important idea. And so uh, people have low vision when even despite best treatment and care, they're still not able to see as well as they need to, to be able to do the regular tasks that they're used to doing. And so, even though someone may tell you, well, you know, unfortunately, there's nothing else we can do with injections. Usually the next line is, but maybe something can be done in regards to magnifiers or other things to help you to function better. And that's something that a low vision specialist would do different than a retina specialist or uh, your general optometrist or general ophthalmologist. This is an area that's pretty specialized that it's important to seek somebody out. And so sometimes people get, get telescopes that are essentially drilled into one of their glasses lenses. For example, where I live in Kansas, it is legal to drive with one of these special telescopic lenses. However, I live about a mile and a half from Missouri and in Missouri, this is not legal. So every state has different rules. So if you're seeing someone that prescribes some of these lenses for you, they should either know or be able to find out for you whether it's legal to drive with these lenses on your glasses. Because again, in some states it's legal and in other states it is not legal. So a good question. Dr. Malley, I don't know if you have any comments on any of those 
uh, lens related questions. Yeah, I think those are, I think those are all great, great responses. And um, yeah, I would say yeah, I agree with the, with the blue blocking, you know, filter. I, I think we still need some more evidence. I and mean, it was really focused on animal studies that we were able to extrapolate from, but um, yeah, I guess it's just one of those things we don't know yet. Yeah, but I think you'd probably agree that blocking the blue light doesn't harm anybody. Correct, yeah, I agree, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you a question. There was actually just some data released even this week on a new medication for macular degeneration. It's called ferisumab. Can you tell us in layman's terms um, anything about why this new information is relevant? I mean, certainly, you know, with, with new treatments, we really want to be able to, you know, improve on a couple of things. We really, you know, durability and um, renal anatomy. So what I mean by durability is, we, you know, patients and, and doctors alike, we want to be able to minimize the number of treatments we have, to, we have to give patients in order to keep them stable. And that's the goal is to really extend those inject, injections out much, much fur, further. And um, with furosemab, we were starting, we were seeing from the, from the data that, you know, potentially, potentially these injections could be given up to every 16 weeks um, on the furthest interval um, and keep patients stable. So again, that's really an advantage uh, of our current medications, which, you know, really, um, you know, we're able to get out to about 12 weeks in some patients theoretically. So um, really, I, th I think it's, it's uh, an improvement on durability and it offers a different mechanism of action in the sense of, you know, of course, it's still attacking um, VEGF. So it's, it's an anti-VEGF treatment, but it also acts on a uh, molecule called ANG2 or ANG2, which we know is, is very important for blood vessel growth development. And that's the problem in wet macular degeneration is growing these, you know, abnormal blood vessels. So we we, we feel like that helps the durability, and again, it it adds additional uh, me different mechanism mechanism of action to help to potentially, you know, uh, give us better outcomes theoretically. So again, there wasn't a there wasn't a really a difference in regards to vision wise. So vision efficacy wise, it was it was same it was the same as equivalent as the other other medications currently, but really. The durability aspect, the longer intervals, and potentially even um, retinal anatomy was was much improved as well over uh, the current treatment that it was compared to. So I, I think there's some advantages there, and just kind of it, it gives us another treatment in our tool belt to give patients that you know that may want longer intervals or that may not be responding to the current medication. So it's a, it's a really a welcome new treatment. Yeah. Um, so there's a question about genetic testing in regards to developing AMD. Um, so, you know, it's interesting because we know that uh, about 70% of who's going to develop macular degeneration is based on genetics. Um, but that means there's another 30% that drives it. So it's not all genetics. Um, I will say that I do do some genetic testing in my patients. Um, and what I think is fairly agreed upon is that... Um, using someone's genetics to help determine their likelihood of their macular degeneration getting worse seems to be fairly well accepted. Um, the other thing that some people do genetic testing for where there's quite a bit of controversy around is, can you decide which vitamins someone should be on based on their genetics? And there's some literature on both sides of that. And so I think you could legitimately take either stance on that, that we could guide uh, supplements based on genetics or not. Um, and just like Dr. Malley said, having more medications is like having something extra in your tool belt. I see um, knowing about your genetics as just another piece to your puzzle. And so it helps us to know a little bit more and to maybe help um, gauge risk. Um, and so an example that I'll give you is, um, so I mentioned the, the instrument for monitoring at home, the 4 home, and for people with intermediate dry macular degeneration or people that qualify, I, I prescribe or recommend it to all of them. But especially if I've done genetic testing to know that someone has you know, more advanced dry macular degeneration along with a high risk based on their genetics of progressing, then I, I, it's even a stronger recommendation. And it really kind of helps to make the case for doing more intensive monitoring. So that's what, that's what I would say about genetic testing. I don't know if you have any, uh, anything different or something to add to that. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with all that. And I, I think that Still, we're still working through additional, um, you know, research on genetic testing. I think we're going to refine that further, and 
I think we'll hopefully have you know more definitive answers um, in the near future on that and can give uh, more recommendations on that. Yeah. So just to let everyone know, we've got about six or seven minutes left. So if you want to uh, send in more questions, we've got a couple more to answer, but we'd love to have you send more in. Uh, Dr. Malley, someone put in, I'm 38 and recently diagnosed with wet AMD. I recently began injections. Is this a lifelong process? Uh, so first thing I would say is, you know, I think that's very unusual um, to have wet AMD at, at age 38. I, I would certainly... I think, I think the first thing is to consider would be to revisit, is this the correct diagnosis? And, and again, I'm not here to speculate on uh, another physician's um, sort of uh, assessment, but I, I would just say that I will tell you the fact is that AMD is typically diagnosed after age 50 or so, at least. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not a disease of the young. Now, there are other kind of masquerading conditions that um, look like AMD, uh, in, in younger people, um, for example, something called myopic uh, CNV or myopic generation, which is because uh, you know patients that are very nearsighted, so their eye, eyeball is a little bit longer than usual, the retina gets a little bit stretched out more um, than usual, and, and sometimes that can cause the retina to be, to be thin and get damaged, very similarly to the way AMD happens, but, but kind of a completely different mechanism. We treat the same way. If they develop blood vessels like wet AMD, we treat it very similarly with, with eye injection. So, I, you know, there's other conditions too that I could, I could go through, but, but really I would revisit that, that diagnosis of wet AMD first. But to, I guess that, to answer the question, you know, I, I think injections, people always, my patients always ask me, you know, how long am I going to be on this treatment, doc? You know, how, how long am I going to be doing this? And it, obviously it's a really difficult, answer, a difficult question to answer, but because everybody's different. But my always my the way I do things is basically I tell patients that they're going to be on once a month treatment um, until the disease is inactive. Once the disease in, is inactive, then I start to extend the injections out in what we call a treat and extend format, where I um, extend the shots out by a one or two weeks each time the patient comes in. And my goal is as long as they're stable and they're inactive, I'm able to keep increasing that interval further and further out until again until we get to about that 12 week mark. And that's when I kind of keep patients on a um, kind of a maintenance dose usually. Now, um, some patients that have been on 12 weeks for a while, I, I offer them the potential of um, what we call as needed treatment. So basically I continue to monitor the patients that are on this kind of regimen. Um, so I'll see them probably a little bit more frequently, like probably every you know two months or so. Um, and I kind of make sure that the, 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 the activity doesn't, doesn't come back uh, while they're off injections. So if it does come back, then I restart the injections again, and then we kind of go through the process a little bit again. But um, some patients opt to just continue 12 week maintenance dosing because they like to have that you know, kind of predictability and they like to have, they know they come in every time for an injection, there's no question one way or another. But some patients opt to be seen a little bit more frequently but are able to withhold injections as long as their disease remains uh, quiescent. So really, it, it just depends on the patient preference. I, there's no medical, uh, in, you know, at least from what I, I'm aware of, there's no really medical reason one way or another. I, that's why I give patients the option in that case. So I would say, like, I always tell patients, lifelong monitoring, not necessarily lifelong treatment. And that's a, that's a great way to put it. Um, so there was a question that I think I skipped over earlier, and it was asking about, um, I think it was called Accusite brand vitamins from Costco. Are they the same as Arid's vitamins? And so the answer to that is actually that if um, someone is prescribed to you to use an Arid's 2 supplement, there's actually right now in the marketplace only one such vitamin. And so unless it says on it Arid's 2, um, then it's not the same. That's not to say that it's not similar, but if you want to use something that's, you know, actually been tested and known to be beneficial, then it's uh, Preservation Arids 2 is the only product with that exact same formulation. So it's a good question because a lot of times you're in, you're in a pharmacy or somewhere and it says same as or similar to, and oftentimes similar to is not at all similar to. So, you know, we need to be careful in, in, in what you're prescribed and then um, what you end up taking. Um, so I'm gonna kind of read through this question for you, Josh, and, and it's kind of an interesting one. 
and we're, we're about out of time. So I apologize to the person asking it because we're gonna have to give a quick answer. It says I have wet uh, AMD in both eyes. Um, the right eye has acuity, it says five feet. So I assume that's like five over 200 and it's not improved with injection treatment. Yet the doctor has me on injection schedules alternating every two or three weeks. He says that if there's fluid, it's worth treating with an injection. Um, do you agree? Um, I know another retina specialist would not treat it at all. My left eye is being treated every 12 weeks and is 2060. So I guess the question is, if you have an eye that has very poor vision that's not responding, does that always require ongoing treatment? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I mean, certainly it, it, it depends on, you know, patient preference and doctor preference. Um, I will say that, you know, typically, you know, if a patient, if, if the eye is a poor seeing eye, like, you know, very poor, like what we call discoform scarring, there's just scarring in the macula, um, you know, the vision is not going to get better for sure. Um, you know, it's really a discussion with the patient and, you know, and some retina specialists like I said, there's a little bit of activity, a little bit of bleeding, but not a lot, uh, or a little bit of fluid there, you know, in the retina, you know, it, it's really debatable. It's really debatable. I mean, really some, some specialists would just say, you know, let's just, let's just watch this. You know, it's not going to get any better. You know, this is a forcing eye. You know, why submit you to injections when we know it's not going to make you any better or, you know, and it is, you really use your other eye anyway. So um, that's one viewpoint, but another viewpoint may say, well, I, you know, you're getting some bleeding here. It's still kind of active. Uh, you know, I know you, you know, theoretically, theoretically that bleeding could even progress, get big enough. I mean, again, theoretically to affect even your, some of your peripheral vision, theoretically, again, uh, that's a kind of rare risk, but I've seen it happen before. If someone can develop, develop a really big blood vessel and, and it bursts, you know, in a, in a large way, it can even affect some of the peripheral vision too, and you can lose that as well, where normally it affects the center part. But again, that's, that's kind of a rare thing to happen. Um, but I, I think it really just comes down to a, a discussion with the patient with the, and, and the doctor saying, you know, should we continue this? Should we not? And again, I always have that discussion with patients. I always like, you know, I make a, a you know, very um, uh, kind of a team decision because I think, again, there's no wrong answer here. It's just really, what do you, you know, what risk do you want to take? And, you know, what do you, what do you want to do? It's really just, it's just a preference thing. So I think you're going to, that's why you're getting different answers from different retina specialists because, you know, it really just comes down to different viewpoints. Um, some people want to treat all the way. Some people just want to, uh, you know, observe because there's no real benefit to that. And I think either answer is probably correct, actually. Yeah, you know, the other thing that I would just add real quickly is, you know, macular degeneration is a frustrating disease for everybody involved, patient and doctor. And sometimes even getting a second opinion from, you know, any other provider just, just to see and to help put your mind at ease. Uh, because a lot of times there may not be a really right answer. And sometimes the best answer is the one that makes you feel good about it. Uh, the last question I'll answer really quickly here, because then we will have gotten through all of our answers and ended right on time, is why do some people get floaters? I've had mine since I was much younger. Is that normal? And the quick answer is floaters are a pretty normal thing for people to develop. As the gel inside our eye changes, then oftentimes shadows that it projects on our retina causes us to see those shadows that we perceive as floaters. So floaters are common. The thing that I would point out is if you have new onset of floaters, so something you know that's there today that wasn't there yesterday, that's something that should get checked out. It's not likely to be related to macular degeneration, but it could be from something totally different. And it's really important to go see your optometrist or ophthalmologist to make sure that it's nothing of any more concern. All right, so that puts us right at our hour. And we got through, I, the, I'm, I don't have the list number right in front of me right now, but I think it was somewhere around 30 or 32 questions that we got through. So that's great. Really enjoy uh, get, being able to get through everyone's questions. Um, but I, but I want to make sure that people don't tune out yet because there's some really good information that's coming up about the 4C home uh, that we mentioned a little bit earlier for monitoring your dry macular degeneration. I want to thank... Uh... Our doctors, uh, Mally and Gerson, uh, just for a terrific uh, seminar. Uh, I think the questions were great. 
Uh, I'd like to invite all of you back to, to additional seminars. Uh, in the meantime, I now want to introduce our, 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 one of our sponsors and our next speaker who's going to talk about this device called 4C Home which is manufactured and marketed under the company called Notovision. Her name is Megan Blepker. Uh, she is an ocular disease residency trained in optometrist. And she is the uh, uh, services a director of clinical affairs and professional relations uh, for Notovision. So it's now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Megan Blepker. Megan, take it away. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate the introduction and um, thanks for sharing your personal story about age-related macular degeneration, your experience with 4C Home, and thanks to you all who are attending for the opportunity to speak today. It is such a privilege and I agree. I think there were some fantastic questions that came in. I really enjoyed the discussion and let me just pull up a brief presentation that I have for you here. which will hopefully just help reiterate some of the really important points that Dr. Molly and Dr. Gerson made um, during their portion of the presentation, during the discussion. And I would like to further share with you some talking points about understanding the importance of early detection of wet AMD and how you can play a role in actively protecting your vision. So 4C Home is actually FDA cleared and Medicare covered. It is prescribed by your eye care professional when you have the appropriate level of vision and the appropriate stage of AMD. And this is actually a form of personalized medicine where the 4C home device is used at home in between your regular eye examinations. And the way it works is it actually detects metamorphopsia or visual distortions that take place in age-related macular degeneration. Just a quick review of AMD. Um, it is the leading cause of severe uh, central vision loss in people over the age of 50 years in the United States. And I'll share with you the information you need to get informed and, and take charge of your vision. As you know, AMD is a chronic condition, meaning it doesn't resolve, it doesn't go away. It's also progressive, which means it tends to worsen over time. And there are the two types, there's the dry type and the wet type. And so dry is the slower changing earlier form of the disease, which puts you at risk for developing the wet AMD type of the disease. And that is the sudden change or more advanced form of AMD. It affects a, an area of the retina called the macula, AMD does, which is responsible for your detailed central vision. You, of course, use this every day in activities like reading, driving, seeing faces clearly. And in dry AMD, these changes occur in the cells at the macula where drusen or those deposits that Dr. Molly and Dr. Gerson discuss build up in the area. And these are the changes that actually may induce that blurry vision, such as difficulty seeing sharp details, both up close and far away. And while dry AMD is a slow form of the disease, these changes, you may not notice them over time. So most importantly, the dry, dry aspect of AMD actually puts you at an increased risk of progressing to the wet form of AMD. So over time, these, the size and the number of these little deposits, these drusen can increase, which actually increases your risk of developing that more sight-threatening form, the wet form. And this can suddenly change from dry to wet without any kind of advanced notice. So if you convert to wet AMD, what happens is abnormal blood vessels actually grow under and into the retina. That's this image on the right side of the screen. So on the left here is where um, we as eye care professionals are looking directly into the back of your eye, looking at that macula, the center portion of the retina there in the back. And then over here is where you're seeing um, those layers. And again, as these blood vessels develop and they leak fluid and when they sometimes bleed, again, without any warning, you may not notice that these changes are significant until dramatic vision loss has actually taken place. And if you convert to wet AMD, the significant vision loss can be rapid, it can be severe, uh, it will cause distortion where straight lines look wavy or dark spots in your vision or just generalized blurry vision like you're seeing here on the screen. And as Dr. Molly and Dr. Gerson mentioned, we have phenomenal medications that are injected in the eye to treat wet AMD. Uh, these are extremely effective, but again, as they had said, these treatments are often, or these are most effective when they're administered early on 
before your symptoms are noticed and before your vision loss has taken place. And so they can halt or slow the progression of wet AMD, but they can't unfortunately restore the vision that's already been lost. Because once the wet disease starts, it'll continue to advance until you receive treatment. And unfortunately, irreversible damage can actually occur from days to weeks uh, before your symptoms are even noticed. But when I say early, you know, what exactly does that mean? How early is early detection? Well, once those symptoms have started, then your vision loss may have already occurred. So once you catch it earlier, you're going to have a better chance of preserving your vision, preserve your independence, and your ability to go about your daily life and just participating in the activities that you enjoy every day. So wet AMD treatments are most effective when the disease is caught early. So 4C Home is an early warning system for your eyes. And as was mentioned, you use this device at home in between your regular eye exam. So it's another tool in the toolbox for both you and your doctor to be monitoring your age-related macular degeneration. And it helps people with dry AMD detect that conversion to wet AMD before you may even notice that any visual changes have taken place. Well, how does it work? You actually just take a simple daily test that checks for tiny changes in your vision, and it takes just a few minutes per eye per day. And then that data from each test is actually sent to your eye doctor, as well as our no television diagnostic clinic, which is the medical provider of the 4C Home AMD monitoring program. And if, in fact, a change in your testing scores is detected, then our diagnostic clinic actually alerts your doctor and then your doctor's office contacts you to come in for examination to follow up on a potential change. Dr. Molly and Dr. Gerson also mentioned the AMSR grid with which you're probably familiar. Here's a graphic over here on the left side, just that grid or that a sheet of paper with the lines there. It was actually developed in the 1940s. And for a long time, it's been recommended as a simple and very accessible tool that you can use at home to monitor for changes in your vision. But Again, by the time you notice any kind of distortions on this grid or this little piece of paper, then significant vision loss may have already taken place. And fortunately, we have newer technology such as our 4C Home AMD monitoring program, and it's been developed to detect just very sensitive, very tiny changes before you notice any symptoms. And then we can report those changes to your doctor so they can bring you in for examination and, and treatment if needed. So testing with 4C Home is very easy. You simply turn the device on and then you look into the viewfinder. There's an example of the device here on the bottom left. Um, it's about three and a half pounds and about the size of a traditional coffee maker. So it's uh, very easy to move around, manipulate and to work with. And then you take a very simple test where in this green portion here in the center, you'll have um, a dot that you'll focus on the center dot. And then a bump is actually going to briefly appear and then disappear. Here's the wave that it shows you right above that. And we ask that you use the mouse that's provided with 4C Home to click where you think the bump appeared and then you'll return to the center dot. So you'll repeat that over time. You'll click where you think you saw the bump and come back to, middle, to the middle um, repeatedly. And then once you're done with your test, the data is actually sent to our no television diagnostic clinic. It'll be evaluated and then um, it will be provided to your eye doctor and you just get into the groove of doing this every day. It's, it's kind of like brushing your teeth or any good healthy habit. Um, and of course, it's, um, it's a one more tool, like I'd said, in your toolbox to help preserve your vision. So 4C Home actually allows you to take this proactive approach protecting your vision and one of our clinical partners will be with you every step of the way during the setup process. So after our no television diagnostic clinic actually receives the referral from your doctor, then our team's going to answer any questions, verify insurance, coverage and benefits, and then ship the device to you. And then once you receive the device, our clinic will then walk you through the setup and training. And then the whole time you're testing, your whole time you're being monitored, you and your doctor will actually receive feedback from our no television diagnostic clinic. Also, as was mentioned, um, our team, like I said, our team's gonna verify insurance and benefits and discuss with you prior to our team sending you the device. So we want to make sure we answer all of your questions, go through any potential payments that you might have and make sure you're comfortable with moving forward, You know that you've accepted the monitoring program before we ever ship you the device and get you started. Um, but if you do choose to move forward, we have low out-of-pocket costs for Medicare patients. Um, Again, as we had stated, that if you have Medicare and a secondary supplement plan, you could have no payment every month. 
Um, if you have Medicare and no secondary supplement, then the average is about $15 per month once your Medicare fee for service Part B deductible is met. But again, our team will go over all of that before we would ever get the device to you to make sure you're comfortable with moving forward. And so your doctor actually sends our No Television Diagnostic Clinic the order for you to begin the 4C Home AMD monitoring program. And appropriate candidates for 4C Home actually have a particular stage of dry AMD, that intermediate stage, an appropriate level of vision. And those, of course, would be determined by examination from your doctor. And then you'll continue to test regularly at home. If a change takes place, then your doctor will be alerted and then we'll have you come in for examination. So our No Television Diagnostic Clinic actually works with your doctor to remotely monitor your dry AMD. And our goal is to help you retain functional vision you know, throughout your entire AMD journey. I'm of course happy to answer any questions you might have. Here's my contact information as well as our website. And again, thank you so very much for your time. I think we have some questions. I'm gonna pull up my screen here. I've got the first question. And by the way, these are phenomenal questions that are being submitted today. So um, the first question is, are there false positives with this test? Um, and in short, the answer is yes. In our home study, which was a very robust clinical trial that added 4C home to the standard of care, it was over 1500 patients and we had, um, um, added the device to the standard of care to determine if earlier detection could be obtained whenever you're using the 4CM AMD monitoring program. And essentially what that study found was there was about one false positive every four years per patient. Now, most tests are gonna have false positives and false negatives, and many are actually designed to provide some false positives because we don't want to miss any disease. And so the consequence to a false positive would actually be just a little bit of inconvenience, meaning you'd have to go in for additional examination. But I think the important thing to remember is that 4C Home actually doesn't detect wet AMD. It actually detects that metamorphopsia or those visual distortions or those changes in the vision. And so a false positive means that something other than a conversion is going on. Uh, it's a great way for you to go in and touch base with your doctor. And um, as we know, age-related macular degeneration is a very dynamic process and it changes over time. So great question. Uh, next question is, how do I get my doctor to get me on this program? So um, as I mentioned, we have a website with all kinds of information for both uh, patients and physicians. And so I would talk to your doctor about 4C Home, would of course direct you to our website. And then I believe the Macular Degeneration Association website has our information as well. And that is at the macularhope.org website. So lots of good info for you there. And the next question is, wouldn't this be good to use for those that have wet macular degeneration to alert the doctor that my eye is bleeding? Um, wonderful question. So 4C Home was actually designed to detect that conversion from dry to wet AMD. And the algorithm, the artificial intelligence is the one that is making the assessment of where a starting point or a baseline for a patient is compared to where they are currently. And then what happens over time is they'll see, the algorithm will determine, the artificial intelligence will analyze that and see if there's been a significant change from where they started to where they are currently, as far as the testing goes. It has not been trained, the algorithm, to actually detect changes once someone already has wet AMD. Um, so the, there, the, that's the medical answer to the question. Um, and then of course the insurance answer to the question would be that there's no indication that's covered by Medicare for wet AMD before C home. It's only that dry intermediate AMD. Um, how easy is it to get this program? Um, again, would direct you to our websites for more information, but uh, first and foremost, talk to your doctor about this. Again, you'd have to be um, a good candidate in the sense of you have to have the appropriate stage of dry AMD and the appropriate level of vision or visual acuity. Uh, let's see. Great question here about arthritis in my hands. And if I have that, will the machine adjust to my ability to follow the test? Excellent question. Um, we do have patients with um, a variety of conditions, um, arthritis, tremors, and other conditions that can affect the testing. The best way to know if you will be able to do it is to give it a try. This is one of the situations where we would rather 
you make an attempt with the test and do the most that you can to try to protect your vision and catch any potential conversion to wet AMD earlier. Um, if it does not work out for you to be able to do that, then of course we would just have you return the device to us. But again, this is an adjunct to what your doctor's having you do already. So as far as any kind of follow-up intervals for your examinations, any kind of nutraceuticals or any other recommendations, diet, exercise, et cetera, that they give to you, this would be like we were saying, another tool in the toolbox. So of course, we'd be happy to work with you, have you give it a try, and then we could always go from there. Um, there's a question about getting the program without a doctor. We actually require a prescription from an eye care professional. So again, I would talk to your doctor about that and then uh, look at our site for more information. And then let's see, I've got a few more maybe coming in. Great questions. Uh, there's a question about what if it takes me longer to do the test? Um, will that affect things? Um, my interpretation of the question is, is when you're physically taking the test, um, if I, if I, I'm not super quick with how I'm clicking and how I'm notifying the device that I'm seeing the target. Um, we like to tell patients that you just take as much time as you need. So the actual stimulus, the actual line with a bump in it will only appear for just a split second of time. And it's designed that way to help keep your focus right in the center so that it doesn't entice your eyes to look away from where we want you to focus on the middle dot there. Um, but as far as the time it takes for you to move the mouse and click where you think you saw the bump, you can take as much time as you need. The device actually accounts for that. And uh, so you should be very comfortable knowing that at first it does take people a little bit to kind of get used to the idea and how the stimulus will be presented and where you'll click and moving the mouse. And over time, just like anything else, the more you practice it, the more comfortable you'll be with it. But you can be comfortable knowing that there's, you can take the time that you need and it won't affect things in that way. All right, I wanna thank our experts and our speakers and everybody who attended. Uh, please give us some feedback on how you uh, perceive this event and join us again next time. Thank you very much and stay safe.